from the boss? Yeah, boss is running. running. Yeah. Did you check your step two? I submitted, but I'm not able to run this guy. I mean, I submitted one, couple of, uh, test one. It's run. Okay. Like short one? Yeah, short one, but I'm running the full one. That's but at least we don't need to complain about bus complex right now. Not now. Not now, unless you are using that. And for login one, you didn't help when you discussed last day, and that day is crashing the whole So. As okay, next, don't bother about this one because we have no shot. So, who is the first? Daniel. So, Daniel is invited to present his uh, <laughs> Wittergy Club contribution. Daniel is presenting his presentation as a first presenter. <laughs> Unambiguous declaration. Carrier lifetimes and they led iodide rich perovskite that were uh, they finalized with uh, molecular dynamics. So, like, with uh, I which guess, journal is it? Hmm? in which journal was it published? This paper, Ju journal of physical chemistry letters, yeah. and who is also uh, Olaf and his group? Ah, okay, uh, is it published or in the division? I think it's under review at the moment. Uh, let's not disclose it. Oh. <laughs> let's not disclose it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, background to this would be uh, a couple terms of uh, non-adiabatic coupling. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I uh, believe that this is <laughs> the equation to non-adiabatic coupling which with the von Oppenheimer approximation. Um, so uh, it takes basically the wave function and the orbitals of the ground state with uh, the summation of a, I think from what Landon was trying to explain to me, this is just a, a vector equation with just the wave function of the energy level that was calculated with the von Oppenheimer. And uh, with this term right there being called the, um, uh, I think it's the, it's the nuclear kinetic energy uh, perturbation uh, operator, along with uh, just the wave functions as, of the ground state as well, over the energies, uh, then finally multiplied by that. So uh, from, Hey yes, Daniel. Yes. Yeah. What are the subscripts on phi? What do um, they mean? On phi, on which, on this one, or uh, on, on both of them? On both of them. So it looks like epsilon and epsilon i. It's kind uh, of hard to tell. With phi, it's uh, I guess the the first one by the equal sign is just a uh, gi. And then the one by the vectors is a. Uh, EV, or yeah, EU. <laughs> and what does it stays for? What is what is the difference between these uh, indexes? Well, or what this indexes actually corresponds to? Okay, well, from the EV, it's from the uh, it's the phi from the uh. From the energy of the vibrational of the uh, Oppenheimer approximation, which is from this one, and the GI is just the ground, the ground, uh, uh, the ground state. So new states for the index of vibrational mode, or what? So you are showing. Uh, can you please look for the first term before summation and explain what is psi and what is phi lowercase. 
uh, which of them is electronic, which of them is uh, vibrational, and why the second factor has two indices. Well, the second factor has two indices? See, this psi has psi sub g yeah. and phi sub gi. So it g stays for the ground state. The, uh, the GI stood st for the ground state, I think is what the paper said. Then what is G? If for GI stays for the, like, there are two indexes. Yes, yeah, so I see what you mean, G, yeah. Then, well, at least some of them should be different. Yeah, um, so. G and GI, I guess, E is excited and G is ground. But I have a question. Did you take this equation from the paper, which you announced in the very beginning, uh, or you took it from somewhere else? They, they didn't really ex they didn't show an equation to how they figured out non-adiabatic coupling in the paper, so I guess I but just... But maybe they cite some other papers where they show in this compilation. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I probably but did you take them like from their references? Where did you get this? Where did I get this? Uh, I. I Found it from another paper that I cited down there. But this is where they cite to, or not? No. Okay. So I guess I should have probably used the one they cited to then. Well, because again, even when we call non abetic couplings, right? So it can yeah. be taken with different approximations. And they might apply some approximations which might be not really applicable in some other cases. So you, you need to be kind of careful and probably go through the sites through the references which they cite rather than just Google something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, you can Google something, but then look on their equation, right, and figure out how how this formula, which you found somewhere, different from what they are using. And again, um, so you're saying that, and I'm completely lost, you said that this is taken into the, in the born oppenheimer approximation, right? Yeah. But Borapikhan approximation doesn't include any non novetic couplings because it's completely decoupled electronic from vibrational degrees of freedom. Borapikhan approximation says that you can neglect this interaction. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really strange that you're saying that you find non novetic coupling in a non in, in a Borapikhan approximation because it means your couplings has to be have to be zero. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what do you mean here? Do you agree with what? With uh, basically what she said about uh, born up and higher approximation does basically sum it up to equal to zero. But you're telling that you are expressing non anybody coupling in basis of. Well, it's a different thing. Did you, did you miss the word basis? Basis. Um, well, he said in approximation of born up and higher, <coughs> right? Yeah. And saying using the born oppenheim approximation for the basis is two different things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, as so means you're rush, taking yeah. your wave function, which really has couplings, mm -hmm. and put it in a basis of those guys which don't have couplings, but with the different weights, right? Yes. It's not just a single orbital, but many of them. And so pretty much the same approach as we uh, apply, in, let's say, in the heart reform. We take in non-interacting electronic states, right? From, from hydrogen atom and kind of put it at, in a base, like this is our basis, and then construct the many electron base. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what is your Born Oppenheimer approximation? Well, uh, these values of E uh, from, I guess, whatever this little paper told me, they, you, these are actually taken from the Born Oppenheimer approximation values. Uh, no you have two indexes, you have two letters. One is psi, and other is. Phi or phi, how you call it? Yeah. How we call it? Psi and phi? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce How it. you pronounce it in Greek? That, that's how I pronounce them. It's up to debate. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. You Greek. don't have Greeks. You know Greeks. But you do learn Greek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, psi. Phi, psi, phi, psi, whatever. Whatever. But there are two of them, right? So yeah. again, distinct between these two notations. What What is one, what is the second? Well, with the V and the E. Well, with these two different letters, why are you having these two different letters? The psi and phi, or phi? Psi and phi? Mm -hmm. Well, 
Psi wouldn't it just be the wave function while um, phi would just be the orbitals? Correct. Let's go step by step. <laughs> you may stay on when this you say, for, for When hour. you say wave function, it sounds like you're talking about many electron wave function, right? Yeah. But we usually don't know it. Where do you uh, get it? Yeah. That's what do you mean? At, at, at a comment. Uh, in, in this this equation, equation is not wrong. We just need to interpret it. <laughs> and I guess we need to. So, question to everyone. Which, what should we cross out or just uh, co cover to return back to board and Penheimer approximation? This, uh, yes, London <laughs> won this. Uh, what was the price? What was the <laughs> <laughs> so, if you remove sum and everything after the sum, you get the uh, overall wave function as a product of electronic and nuclear wave functions. Stop. <laughs> he already gave you the hint right away. So now you need to figure out what one is electronic and what one is nuclear. So which one? Which is electronic? Again, which is if, the, if we say that now in born oppenheim approximation, the electronic degrees of freedom is independent from, uh, from the vibrational, from the nuclear degrees of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So then, you can represent the overall wave function as a product. One function stays for the, or one orbital stays for the electronic orbital, and other stays for the just uh, nuclear. Right? Yeah. If the product, then they don't interact. And this is your first term. So now you just need to figure out which one is electronic and which one is uh, vibrational, or stays for the nuclear motion, for the nuclear wave function. Well, and this should give you some ideas about these indexes, probably. So I, I believe the well nuclear terms would be the, the these terms right here the the ones with the I guess the subscript with the epsilon. With one index or with two indices? Uh, nuclear would be with uh, I believe with just one index. Uh, and if you think longer, <laughs> <laughs> you think longer with two indexes. Okay. Why they should have two? Well, let's start with electronic. If electronic has just single index, right? Yeah. It tells you just the state, right? Yeah. In a quantized system. Then why the nuclear should have two indexes? Or what kind of meaning of this two? Yes, because the nuclear would just, I guess, depend on two different. Um, well, one index probably should correspond to to the index related to the motion of your nuclear, right? Which would yeah. be dependent on a uh, coordinate of nuclear motion, right? And then the other one? Yeah. Just depend, I guess, on this. On the, well, it looks like they have pretty much the same index. Yeah, they, they, I guess yeah. they, they do. <laughs> So it means they should connect it to the electronic state, right? Yeah. So kind of it's a nuclear wave function which depends on the coordinate of the electron and kind of as independent variable and the coordinate of nuclear, right? Also as an independent variable, but it still depends on both. Just these variables are independent. Means you can fix one and get the other or backward. You can fix the first and get the other. And those which corresponds to the electron degrees of freedom, right? So they, of course, kind of should be connected to the solution of the wave function for the electrons, right? So that's why this index will be kind of connecting, connecting everything to the uh, electronic degrees of freedom, right? And the second index will be really related to the nuclear motion. Am I right? No. So why there are two indices for, for nuclear wave function? And, and uh, Generally, keep, keep answering. Generally, if you, if you present, you may give definition uh, for audience. Nice. Well, that's how that works. Um. <laughs> so why is there both uh, the electronic and the nuclear? Yeah, why uh, the nu nuclear wave function has two indices? Why uh, it why can't we use only the index that is different from electronic? 
keep only I and skip G. Well, um, potential energy surface, which determines shape of nuclear wave function, is different for each electronic state. Therefore, one needs to, to have index corresponding to it. And this is your connection precisely from degrees of freedom, right? Yeah. So, like, if you go to very high electronic degrees of freedom, you expect that your nuclear yeah, potential surface should be kind of related or different from those which are going to the ground state of electronic state function. <laughs> Very nice definition. If uh, someone would ask me to introduce non-everybody coupling, I would never show this equation. But we don't know what the form of this T. You probably need to really kind of represent T with this definition. So what exactly your operator T, That's how does it look like? That's a legitimate question. Well, I guess Can you write T equals and, and, and give, or at least verbally tell? Well, he well, told yeah. already what is it, but yeah. we need a formula, right? Yeah, I guess I, didn't, I, I don't think in, the, in that paper too. I got this formula. They didn't explain what T was. They just verbally, well, but you can you can tell. Really said it. But repeat again. What is it? Is the definition? Uh, it's basically, two uh, nuclear kinetic energies. Can you write the operator for kinetic energy? Uh, the operator from, from kinetic quantum energy. mechanics. Top my head. Uh, oh, for classical mechanics, I don't know. Start with something at least. Uh, yeah, I guess. Just some formula for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy? Yes, what? Formula for kinetic energy would probably just be what? EK equals. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is for classical, at least. Oh. Is it on there? That would just be the P mass times the acceleration. Oh, that would be just more. <laughs> mass times acceleration? <laughs> Okay, it's a Newton, well, I mean, overall it would be a force, not really energy, but yeah. you can get energy from it. So then What's the connection between force and kinetic, energy? Kinetic. No. <laughs> what you wrote on the top is not K, it's F. Force equal MA, based on the first Newton's law. But if you... Usually, if you have a force acting on something, you, it means you're characterizing potential. Energy. Yeah. But we're interested in a kinetic energy. Should it depend on velocity uh, or momentum? No, when it just depends on the potential. Kinetic energy depends on potential. Yeah. And potential <laughs> energy depends on kinetic. Great. It's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> you shouldn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe anyone can be more successful than we are. Can you hint something? Maybe give them a, him a hint so he can immediately... Because I'm sure you have seen this formula many times. One half. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, let's see what it comes. One half. At least you should have one half in your formula. You can write T prime sub N equals one half. And this would be absolutely right. Good start. But you need, as a coefficient, right? But you need yes. to, to finish with something more, with some physical variables. Does your kinetic energy depend on, depend on mass? I believe so. Proportional or reverse proportional, square, cubed, linearly? Logarithmic. Logarithmic <laughs> exponential. Wouldn't it be square? Sorry. Mass square. There is a square in this formula. It's like an Einstein's formula. <laughs> Energy equal mc square. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay, yeah. So this is kind of classical form. Uh, if you write this, can you now write it through the momentum? Do you remember what is momentum? So. Moment of inertia, how it goes? No. Measure of inertia. Moment. Uh, momentum is a measure of inertia, right? No. Measure of motion. Mass is measure of inertia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, momentum. 
So in other words, you have the same velocity and you have one small mass and one big mass, which will be having a larger momentum. Which one has the larger mass and the one that weighs more? Okay. And now you assume that their mass is the same. We have two identical masses, but one moves twice faster than the other. Which momentum would be faster? It would be larger. Faster. Okay, so then actually in this case they are linear proportional. So your momentum equals just m times v, right? And now if you play with this formula, you already have a m times v square. Can you write it through the momentum? If momentum equals m times v, then t would be equals would equal to Oh, I guess what? Just combine those terms together so it just be what? Nah, I just combine you? both the terms together. Mm. Well, if you would have, if you want, like, if we will have v square m square, then it would be momentum square, right? Yeah. But you have v square, but you don't have m square. What to do? In mass, it's really nice. You can multiply by m and divide. Nothing is changed, right? Mm -hmm. But then on the top, you will have your m square. So do it and see what happens. Like, multiply by m and divide by m. You keep doing it, you just detain audience with a comment. In physics, there is a method of dimensionality. When, when, if you need to get an answer for some variable, you just write down all variables. They just have multiply like, by m and divide by the, mm -hmm. the momentum? The right until you well, right take you 1 over 2 v square m yeah. times m divided by m. If you, do, if you multiply m divided by m, nothing is changed, right? Yeah, it's just one. Yeah. But multiply and see what happens. Like, really write it and see how you can play with it. Multiply by m. And divide by m. So uh, I guess if I multiply by m, it's going to be m squares. Okay. E two. And divided. You still have m at the bottom, right? I have the m in the bottom in this equation. I guess the last one that I wrote. Because you multiply by m and divide it by m. You still need to divide by m, otherwise you change yeah. your equation. So, what well, doesn't that just cancel out the square? But you don't want to a cancel a it because you want to have m square v square because it gives you p square. Now, your formula will end up with what? One half. On the top you have p square, right? On the bottom you will have m. P, p square, p, not v. Uh, m right. times v is p. m square v square is the same as p square. Great. And now, by your next very natural step, you convert it in a quantum form. <laughs> <laughs> now you need to remember what is your operator of momentum in quantum mechanics, right? And just substitute your p as an operator of momentum. Do you remember what is operator of momentum in, a, in quantum mechanics? Operator of momentum? Uh huh. That's with minus, I, minus IH, right? What does? Anyone remembers? Is the yeah. Is there an H? Minus your ball over two. I guess. Uh, I, yeah. Do you want me to say it? Yeah, yeah, do it. Okay. It'd be negative I H D by D X. Okay. First derivative with respect to X. But if it's a square, then? Then D squared by D X squared. Second derivative with respect to the coordinate. Right? Oh, you might write it. <laughs> so you will still have mass there. You will have one half divided by m, right, and then second derivative with respect to the coordinate. Now, the question is which coordinate? You said that this is a kinetic energy of what? Of electrons or one nuclei? Uh, the, um, the nuclei, I believe. Well, this is what you define your t, right? So if it's a kinetic energy of a nuclei, then which coordinate you will take as a, as a, as a derivative? Coordinate of electrons or coordinate of nuclei? Uh, the coordinates of the nuclei. Great. And you can use any letter, but just declare it. Which letter would you like to use for coordinate of nuclei? <laughs> N. Huh? Well, N. Okay, you are free to define whatever you like, but typically it is either X or R, and some people like R. Big R. Big R. Uppercase. Uppercase. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so is there any more questions on the non adiabatic coupling? Oh, no. No, no. I have another one. What does the prime mean on the T? Uh, it, it looks like a prime from the blurry vision we have. It, it takes. It's basically uh, how they explained that. It was just it's uh, it's taken into account two of them instead of one. Uh, nuclear, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you're so confident. Uh, yeah. Levi? Yes. Don't oh. believe him. Um, I have uh, a, I, a I, hypothesis. I don't I know the source. Have... But um, if Daniel was verbally declaring every, everything literally word by uh, word, probably he told that it is quantum part of nuclear kinetic energy. Oh, that's why it's prime, right? So you can, uh, if you already know the classical trajectory, you can define overall momentum as expectation value plus quantum operator. And then you can split kinetic energy on uh, contribution from classical mechanic and the contribution from uh, quantum mechanics that will, uh, will not change trajectory anymore, but will affect only like broadening. Okay, but I guess my question... Guess. Yeah, my question deals with uh, the ortho uh, the if you conjugate two wave uh, orbitals that are not the same is equal to zero. So wouldn't the second term be if there's no t uh, time zero because you would only have diagonal elements which are your is your first term in the expression? The kinetic energy operator uh, includes derivatives as uh, Daniel has introduced to us. And uh, these derivatives will change functional form of the functions on the right side. Left and right, that's why there will be not give you zero, right? Because okay. you take a derivative, Good. actually second derivative, from your, uh, from your right, right? And then overlap with what you have on the left. And an another comment that it looks like uh, Daniel presents us influence of non adiabatic coupling onto time independent uh, states. So it is first order perturbation theory giving corrections to, to the wave functions and, and energies, but not to uh, dynamical processes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this equation looks a little unusual for many of us. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Because we still have presentation from Japan. <laughs> so we like, start in 25 minutes. <laughs> All right. So, are there any more questions on this? Um, we decided to move on, dependent on the questions. <laughs> okay. So, I guess, um, I guess another term to explain is a radiative recombination. And I guess, from my understanding of this, it's whenever an electron moves from the conduction band over to, I guess, the empty valence band associated with that hole, uh, an energy, uh, an electron will emit its energy Always. and it relax to uh, the hole, correct? Always. Always? Always. Okay. Independent on anything. So as soon as electron is on a luma and returns back to home, it always radiates. Everyone agrees? No. Really? No. Oh. Now it's your turn. Correct. <laughs> July, you know. Listen to the question. Repeat your statement. <laughs> <I was> right. <laughs> he was defining the radiative recombination. I guess from my understanding, it's whenever an electron moves over from the conduction band to the empty valence band associated with that hole, I guess the electron will emit its energy and relax into that hole. It emits energy in form of light, in form of electromagnetic field. Light. Do you agree? It's not true always. Then how? Then correct. When is it not true? Or when is it true? So kind of a lot. It can relax to the whole in a lot of different way. But what would be so, the condition when it really will emit light when it returns to its uh, home? Their uh, momentum should be. Which momentum? 
sorry, transition dipole moment should be in should be zero one should, ten should be zero. should be <laughs> help mm. help us should be what non zero non zero non zero, non -zero. Non -zero. if it's zero then it's actually it non rotatively and then there would be some other channels to mm. put your hole so. Actually, it's not always true. When you re you can return back from wherever you're uh, from your lowest unoccupied state, what you call conduction band, to the highest occupied state, H of the valence band, right? Yeah. You can radi you can do it radiatively or non radiatively. Both mechanisms are possible. To have it radiatively, then you need to have a special property for your wave function of your home and doom of your ages uh, states uh, at the H of your valence and conduction band, so that if you use this orbitals and calculate your transition dipole moment, then it has to be not equal to zero. If it equals to zero, because of the symmetry of the wave functions, right, it can be zero, then, then it will be not radiative, and then there should be some other processes to be involved. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so I guess that also solves, well, a next term non-radiative combination, but that's basically just the electron fits into the hole without any emission. So. Without emission of electromagnetic quantum, yeah, yeah. but energy must be conserved. Something. So it's lose energy anyway in both cases, right? Yeah. The only question is, it lose energy in, in which form? In, into which degree of freedom? If it lose energy in electromagnetic <laughs> way, as an like electromagnetic wave needs light, right? Then it's a need. If not, then it's not a need. But then it can lose it to the phonon vibration, for example, to heat. <laughs> All right, because, well, I guess that's sort of triggered what non radiative electron just gives the energy free away. Away to where? To, to who? Yeah. Again, we, we cannot just lose energy to nothing, right? Okay. Again, because of the conservation energy law. Does it lose it to the hole that it, that it occupies? Well, energy of hole is low. So you lose energy, like a difference, this is a, the, the loss of energy. So you cannot just lose it, it has to be taken by something. It's either taken by photon, this is your electromagnetic wave, right? Okay. And yeah. this is, you see as a shining light, or it goes to heat, which again means it goes to vibrations. Your atoms, your nuclear starts move just more frequently, <laughs> more rapidly. Yes, okay. Oh. So I guess I can move on to, uh, I guess, more about the paper itself. I guess, <laughs> well, a quick little introduction to this is the whole point to the lab, to, I guess, the experiment was to find out the uh, effects on the surface by two different types of, uh, uh, of uh, perovskites. One where the surfaces contain a lead iodide rich uh, surface, and the other one where the surface is a more of a methyl ammonium iodide rich uh, system. So the difference between both of them is that well the methyl ammonium cations they contain a they contain high frequency phonons strong electric fields and why is it high frequency phonons high electric well more why is it high frequency phonons yes because I would say it's probably well yeah yeah well I, I I guess I can show you. How the frequency of phonons will be affected by mass? Atomic mass of the... Of the molecule. Of atoms involved in... in well, the methyl ammonium cations, they're, they're much uh, lighter uh -huh. uh, cation com well, ion compared to the lead iodide. Uh -huh. So, I guess the phonons... But the phonons if we think about harmonic approximation, yeah. right? So this is a kind of very valid approximation if you are close to the uh, ground state, close to the equilibrium for your nuclear motion, right? So then how would the frequency depends on the, depends on the mass, well, on the, on the mass, on the K, kind of, you know, the hardness of your spring, or the, the type of the bond, the, uh, I'll say, the strength of the bond. Force to uh, Anyone remember this formula? Usually people use the cyclic frequency, omega. Omega, equals omega is equal to the square root of k over mu. Said Levi looking in the Google. <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm actually looking at the paper. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> strange frozen. <laughs> uh. So it's a root square k over m, where m is your mass, right? Yeah. And k is a kind of, you know, the strength of the bond. But now we go with this mass. The lighter, the smaller m, the higher the frequency, because it's a reverse proportional, right? Root square, one over m. Yeah. So if you make your m very high, your f goes down and backward. Oh, I guess I didn't really... No? Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I just didn't really think about like the force constant, things like that. Uh, well, I for for force that. constant, we even didn't really... Well, for force constant, I don't know, it's a little bit harder. Well, you can think now about the strength of the bond between what boron... Uh, what do you have? Um, there lead a, iodine or what yeah. is really moving in this uh, in these vibrations? And your ammonia, which is nitrogen, I guess. Ni is it connected yeah. with nitrogen? Uh, it has hydrogen connected to the nitrogen, which is connected no, to, to the No, to the lead. Bond. Lead is coordinated with nitrogen probably, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's really probably this bond lead nitrogen versus lead iodine. So, I don't know, K also might be different, and actually with K, it's backward behavior. The stronger, the larger frequency. But probably mass is, is the main factor here. Okay, yeah, uh, they said that, well, I just assumed the metal, the lighter uh, cations are more freely to move just because they're But see, lighter. all the things is very easy if you really remember formulas from physics mm -hmm. and quantum mechanics. Yeah, and I gotta, I gotta go back and really uh, review my homework on that. <laughs> no. Not a doubt, without a doubt on that. One small comment on that. What is the second bullet? Is that phosphorus bromine iodine or lead iodide? Uh, this one? Mm -hmm. uh, lead iodide. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put a lowercase. He should, yeah, I yeah, should that one. <laughs> I think I did that a lot of times. So, yeah. If I did that here, I uh, probably did it throughout the rest of the slides too. So I looked at the intro of the paper and the high frequency modes are for the organic materials not the entire lattice. I believe. Which still yeah, valid with yeah. your yeah. mass, right? Because you have much lighter mass of ammonia comparing to iodine in the lattice. But right. again, your, your molecules should they, be, uh, okay. they are not by themselves, they are connected, through the, so coordinated with the lead. So you expect that your lattice kind of contribute to this uh, normal mode as well. Just due to this bonding with a lab. So, continue. Let's continue. Okay, so the methyl the methyl ammonium cation cation rich surface also has strong electric fields, and this uh, basically couples to charge carriers, so it makes it have stronger charge carrier uh, interactions. Uh, along with this uh, system, they also have larger uh, non-adiabatic coupling, and with the lead ion surface rich uh, system, they, a non-adiabatic coupling, you actually see a drop by nearly an order of a magnitude, and it is theorized that because of this, uh, of the reduced non-adiabatic coupling, the charge carrier lifetime is, is significantly improved due to uh, some experimental results they've seen. And um, the system can also suppress the non-radiative charge carrier recombination, which um, is talked more about thoroughly through the uh, calculations they did, the molecular dynamics. And uh, I can move on to, is there any more questions? I guess just a little quick introduction to this. So here, as I explained earlier, is the lead iodide rich system and the methyl ammonium iodide rich system, which just the surfaces are just uh, highly concentrated compared one to the other. So here in, in the figures B and D. Daniel, can, can yeah. I interrupt for a really silly question? What are those black diamonds? What are those black diamonds? Oh, what, do they, what do they symbolize? The perovskite structure at room temperature. It's the tetragonal um, structure. But if, if some of us do, didn't have chemistry background, like how to interpret this? Uh, Diamonds. I guess as a crystal lattice, or I guess in the. So you said already like octahedral. Each each of these diamonds is your octahedral kind of uh, what yeah. structure, right? Yeah. Should should I interpret like lead iron has this diamond shape? <laughs> <laughs> to tell yeah. literally how to interpret it. How to interpret it? Well, I guess at the ends of each side, 
would be the uh, the agates on the on each of the ends. Well, I guess the lead would be on the bullet. Oh, okay, okay, good. So I guess it's just I guess the shape of the bonds, I suppose, with. So, so it's a sacrifice. No. So we can do Lead, lead in the middle. An iodine in. On the on the corners. On the corners. How so many corners? Composition you have? Same, just surface is different. Right? Composition of the both system is same, just surface is different. Yeah, just the surfaces are different. No, 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 no. She, she's asking. He's asking about like your, how to for your uh, for your C case, right? In these octahedral structures, what do you have? You you still have iodine in your uh, in your corners so of uh, yeah yeah. The only thing that's different is the surfaces where where we see the um, actually yeah right here on the surfaces. So you see in the bottom. It's not that the, the surfaces are also in a, in, a, in a intermediate layers as well. Then where they are? Yeah. yeah. So oh, isn't it iodine on the uh, corner of each diamond? Yeah. Yes. Are you asking what's the difference between the two structures? Yes. Oh, well, I, I guess you see at, at the ends, at the surfaces, at the bottom surface, the top surface, they have a lead iodide. It's just the tetragonal structure cut in half, where we expose, where the lead iodide surface is exposed. So ah, so it's just different lattice, how, yeah. how yeah. they cut. cut. How they cut Same surface, but at a deep, like one is cut, cut at half. the full unit cell and another at a half of unit cell. So you have different termination. One is yes. terminated by iodine, and another is terminated by uh, ammonia. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. So. Uh, with the figures B and D, they took a partial density of states to see um, which, I guess, atoms or, uh, or molecules are uh, adding con huge contributions to the density of states. So what they found was uh, the methyl ammonium hardly had any or if uh, contributions to the bands, while uh, the lead had somewhat a uh, little contribution, while they saw the major uh, player in the density of the states was the iodine atom. So I guess they could just assume that the methyl ammonium doesn't really have a huge uh, effect on the conduction band. Daniel? Major uh, iodine is major contributor to valence band, mm. but for conduction but band, major, co major contributor is lead, right? right? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. So your iodine contributing to the valence band, and it's kind of similar in both cases. Yeah. But for the conduction band, conduction band is lead. Yeah. Then it's lead, and is it still like both are dominated by lead, right? Yeah. Red, red is your lead. Yeah. But then, what exactly is the difference you say? The difference, well, I guess they just wanted to see whether, do you know how since one surface, the lead iodide is more exposed and the methyl ammonium iodide is more significantly, well, is more easily approached or uh, attacked, I guess. Oh, the, the, the gap is larger for methyl ammonium rich. Yeah. yeah, I was also going to point to that table too. Uh, the band gap is about almost half an EV, EV uh, bigger in the methyl ammonium system compared to the lead iodide system. But ammonia doesn't really contribute no. directly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The methyl ammonium doesn't really, yeah. The conduction band is also the same in the both cases from the lead. Really? You see red going cheaper, cheaper more. I mean, conduction, sorry, not conduction band, balance band. Balance band is, it doesn't shift anything, not even lead. Lead also in close to the frontier of it all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it looks like it's mainly, it's, Unoccupied states, which really makes a difference. Specifically, yeah. So the methyl, methyl ammonium doesn't hybridize with frontier orbitals, but it changes the the gap. The gap. Yeah, it opens the gap somehow. Yeah. Um. So what they, I guess, they sort of a. Uh, came on, under the conclusion of why there's a much uh, smaller uh, band gap is due to unsaturated chemical bonds that are uh, present right there. And I guess they could theorize it as a uh, shallow trap states. Uh, also because of the smaller band gap, uh, this should also accelerate uh, radiative recombination rates so that they uh, I'll explain that more in a little bit, I guess, in a couple slides where they actually did a little test on this to uh, observe those rates. 
But uh, I guess in, when we go up to the table right there, they figured out how tau, which is the charge recombination rate, was uh, pretty much found to be almost a magnitude bigger than the methyl ammonium iodide. And the NAC, or the non adiabatic couplet, was also found to be basically almost a whole magnitude bigger in the methyl ammonium iodide rich system. However, uh, I guess in this case where they considered pure phasing time as a term, but I guess they used it to explain it as quantum coherence. I didn't really understand what that term meant, but like, I guess coherent meant like how you understand was, something. I, I forgot, was it Brandon or was it Levi who was presenting it last when Year. it was in April? It was spring. It was my, me. Or fall, I don't remember. It was Levi? Yeah. Yes. So can you, can you help with definitions then? Um, so if you think about a uh, cosine wave, right? Yeah. It starts out at the maximum and then it goes down and then it goes up and so forth, right? So okay. quantum mechanically, you can use that and cosine where, I mean sine where sine rapidly oscillates, which means uh, if you multiply the rapidly oscillating sine to, by the cosine, it does like an envelope function. And when the envelope function goes to zero, you're out of phase completely. And since the system can't get back into phase, we don't really care about the rest of it going back up. We just care that it drops to zero. And that is if you kind of, uh, so the cosine itself is like the external thing with a sine. Uh, it, those are kind of the um, ways to measure how the system evolves in time, which means that they start to get out of phase. And then once they're out of phase, they're done. I know that's terrible, but that's all I remember right now. <laughs> Okay. And Daniel, you, you can you can tell to all of us. Oh, yeah. According to definition by Levi, I'm continuing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that uh, nice explanation. <laughs> so, no explanation. Based on Levi's explanation, they they uh, they made a graph. <laughs> the the coherence. And due so to that, the they found out it's basically similar. So between these two systems, there wasn't too much of an effect on the quantum coherence. But uh, they fit it to this Gaussian, this exponential decay, where they took the um, the charge combination rate divided by the dephasing time squared. Then they took half of that exponential, and they got this graph. So the big picture from that is that uh, quantum coherence is not really a, a major player in these two systems. So with this one, this graph is based off of the charge carrier recombination rates or the, uh, excite, the decay of the excited state population. So you see that the, the charge car carrier com uh, recombination rate of the methyl ammonium iodide is only lasts about three and a half seconds compared to the lead iodide rich system that lasted almost a whole magnitude bigger. It's population of which state? The excited state. And where do they excite? Or it is lowest excited state. The lowest excited state? Uh, it probably would have been the lowest excited state. I didn't really think about that, I guess, which excited state would it be then, because I guess there is many of them. <laughs> well, since it goes only less than percent within 10 picosecond, it's very likely that it is lowest excited state. And um, when you were presenting the introduction, you made an accent on recombination, radiative and non-radiative, which means from the lowest excitation. Okay, yeah, lowest. Can you go back to the density of states? Oh, yeah. I see it too. She sent it to me. And, and uh, finger, where is the lowest excitation? Where is the lowest excitation? Yes, from word to word. Where to where? Yeah, electron from, from where to where is excited to form a lowest excitation. Wouldn't it just be from the, the bands? From, H's. from the top of the valence band 
two were? To the what? top of that conduction thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> top of the conduction thing or lowest so they conduction thing? Bottom, bottom, bottom. bottom of the conduction. Kind of your first excited state, right? <laughs> from home to lumen, as it were. It's problematic to do. And then they look the on the retaining bag, a recombination, right? So it's not really relaxation. They're not going from one retonic level to another in a band. They go through the gap, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called recombination. Um, Moving. They don't want to be nice. So uh, I was just wondering if anybody else had any more questions on this one. I guess there's the equation of the Gaussian they fitted to as well. For the stepwise population change in the A panel, did they correlate that to any specific motion in the material? it looks like it's about two picoseconds per um, step. Oh, sorry, what was the question again? Did you say like to which structure or? No, no, no. P please repeat the question. It's a very interesting question. Yep. So in your A panel, you, you can it? see that the population looks like, um, you know, a set of steps. Yeah. And so from one step to the next, it looks like it's close to uh, two picoseconds on their time scale. Did they say anything about why there were these types of steps? Was there a specific motion um, from, you know, a given atom that correlates to that? Uh, I don't think they mentioned something like that. Because uh, I guess... They just sort of took it back to where um, where they basically just said it was due to the non adiabatic coupling um, rates that you saw that you see that the lower non adiabatic uh, I guess value that the lead iodide rich system is uh, emitting is the explanation for why there is such a huge uh, difference between uh, I guess both uh, graphs. Um, can you yeah. can, can I um, contribute and uh, extend the question of uh, John? Yeah. So, in few next slides, you may show how non adiabatic couplings depend on time. So then they are not time independent, and maybe the change in time of first non adiabatic couplings. And second, the uh, occupation of lowest excitation are dictated by repeating pattern of molecular motion. Maybe it is contraction of some specific bond. Maybe it is a rotation of methyl ammonium as a whole uh, object. But uh, John is asking authors of the paper through you as their representative yeah. which atomic motion is responsible for this interesting feature that it is not a straight line but it goes <laughs> through the steps and steps are uh, have the same uh, pattern same duration approximately two picoseconds long oh uh, yeah you're talking about like the little i guess quick drops thing yes quick drops so the question is about quick drops and origin of these quick drops john am i representing you right yeah that's correct okay it looks like they didn't they didn't discuss it. Not too much. They just blamed it on the non adiabatic so couple. Then, if it's a still under review, it's this would be a question to ask for the for the authors. Okay. Who is writing the review? Okay. Let's not disclose. Okay, so this is the the time dependent absolute non adiabatic coupling chart of the two systems. So in red is the methyl ammonium iodide, and if you could barely see the lead iodide rich system, you see that uh, methyl ammonium iodide has a huger uh, contribution than the lead iodide, which is nearly basically non present in the uh, graph. So what they uh, 
blamed this huge, uh, or not blamed, but uh, rationalized this huge difference is the non-adiabatic coupling fluctuated a lot due to, I guess, uh, the proportional to the nuclear velocity. So they said that the velocity of the lead iodide system played a huge part in the fact that you see such a huge discrepancy with the lead iodide system, which was barely existent at all. Mm. And, um, but which one again fluctuates, red or black? Or they kind of fluctuate simultaneously well, I in guess, the same way? I guess they, they blame the fact that, uh, well, you know how you see basically the methyl ammonium iodide uh, overwhelms the lead iodide, you barely see. Uh, Daniel, is there a contradiction in how you uh, present the story and what, in what, what they write? So in, <laughs> yeah. in the table and, and ra rational explanation, uh, you are telling that lead-rich surface has unsaturated bond, therefore it gives quicker relaxation. Or I misinterpreted. And here you show that lead-rich uh, is like order of magnitude lower than anybody coupling. Yeah. Were you saying so? Yeah, I said that. Is, is it in, in the uh, contradiction? Like if the non adiabatic coupling is smaller, then transitions should be slower yeah that, that's sort of why I, I, I printed, presented this paper today instead of Tuesday because there was, the paper just kind of contradicted itself many times so I kind of had a hard but time but are you sure it. this is exactly the statement like again if you return back to your table not to your to yeah. their table to the table of non anabetic couplings right so you're saying that which of these couplings are larger uh, the methyl ammonium system by almost, the larger couplings. Yes, by almost nine times bigger. Okay, and they also overlap. Then there's no contradiction. Why is it contradiction? So coupling larger ten times? Y and, yes. and lifetime is shorter. Yeah, the lifetime is okay, shorter. Then, 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 then it, 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 it's, okay. uh, it's no contradiction. It agrees with itself. Okay. Because again, coupling is proportional to the jumps, to your to jump from oh. highest to low state, right? Yeah. So the larger the coupling, the quicker it jumps. The, the, the larger the probability that it jumps, right? Mm -hmm. Which means it should be quicker with a higher probability. Yeah. So no contradiction. Uh, would you permit me to approach your screen and yeah, point you something? Can, you can absolutely, yeah. <laughs> John, do you, do you see the screen as it transmitted? He should see the paper, which was... No, 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 it, it, here. Yeah, well, I see the screen and I have the paper pulled open right now. Okay, so the black features oscillate less vividly than the red features, and they mm -hmm. appear like maximum, then nothing, then maximum, then again nothing, with regularity that may correspond to this uh, two uh, picosecond... Yes. Well, I was going to say, there's one, yeah, there's a panel C um, of this figure that has the um, wave numbers for the phonon frequencies. So if he has that in the next slide, that, uh, yep, this one. So? Oh, okay. Um... So the difference between these two is that the methyl ammonium iodide, well, this is a phonon influence spectra. Uh, you see that the methyl ammonium iodide system, which is the one in red, has higher frequency phonons compared to, I guess, the lower frequency uh, phonons that are exhibited by the lead iodide system. And uh, so I guess this is why you see the huge fluctuations of the NAC values. Okay. Uh, Daniel, from your chemical background and, and experience, what is the frequency of carbon to nitrogen stretch, car car uh, carbon to nitrogen bond oscillation in uh, inverse centimeters? Inverse centimeters? <laughs> I know carbon carbon. So what, what it is? 1500 wave number. <laughs> so they, they miss, uh, they're not showing the right uh, range? I guess because their range is dictated by the lead iodine or maybe lead ammonia. Uh, so this stretches between carbon and nitrogen do not contribute to couplings. Not not at this range. <coughs> it's 
It should be much higher. No, you'd have to extend this up to like 2,000 wave numbers to even look at any of those. Yeah. Okay. But reviewer may ask authors to show. Or it might be not really contributing to the couplings with this, uh, because again, this is just for the homo luma transition, right? To your ground, uh, to your first excited mm -hmm. to the ground state. And not necessarily that this transition is really coupled to your very high intensity phonons. Possible. Which is possible. Because if it would, then it probably would be non radiative. Is it radiative mm -hmm. transition, by the way? Do they say anything about it? Radiative transmission? Transition. Um, for uh, which just don't. Yes. Well, the slow transition, your homo lumen transition. Like you excite, they excite and then yeah. it returns back, right? But is it support, like they said, like it's radiative, non-radiative recombination. Yeah. So, so which way it goes through radiative recombination or through not radiative recombination? Uh, they just kept saying non-radiative for <laughs> the lead iodide system. Mm -hmm. For both structures. Well, I, I guess yeah. I guess if they said they compared it things that lead iodide suppresses. Uh, non radiative com recombination compared to, I guess, yeah. So they do not give oh, numbers for, ra for radiative channel. Yeah. So they assume that radiative channel is much takes much longer. I assume, yeah, I think that's the approach they uh, return took. back to the previous slide, even two previous, uh, where you have population. Yeah. What do you mean longer? 23 nanoseconds? So this is in the range of radiative yes. time, same as three in the second. So, no, do they say ex explicitly if they neglect or take into account radiative channel? Well, again, in your initial kind of uh, introduction part, right, you were talking about radiative and non-radiative yeah. recombination. But do they in the paper really make any conclusion? So what kind of recombinations they have here in the structures, radiative or non-radiative, or maybe one is more and another is less, I don't know. I think what kind of evidence is they provide? Well, the fact that they, what they stated with the lead out system, that it suppresses non-radiative, and then doesn't the radiative and non-radiative, don't they just compete with each other? So if you suppress one, wouldn't the other one happen? Um, is that how that works? Or not really? Radiative seems, well, I can be wrong, but it seems to be independent of non-radiative. The, um, they don't what, what each other? Well, they do compete, even if they, they're not they, they, they compete in a sense like radiative is, all, let's say, always the same, and non-radiative may withdraw part of the reaction channel from radiative. In one central, they justify the higher recombination rate for the methyl aluminum by saying that when the methyl aluminum on the surface since it's a lighter atom, it can, its motion is higher than compared to lead, and which can change the dipole moment. Transition dipole. Transition dipole. But they do not report transition dipole, neither spectrum. As they mentioned, they didn't say transition dipole, they're just saying that it will change the dipole, which will increase the electron and hole uh, recombination wave. Okay, so they provide 10 wave <laughs> so I guess this part is when it comes to the the emotions. So I guess it's more about this kind of relates to the slide back here. Well, the slide right here to compare to I guess to be able to see. The higher fluctuations of the non adiabatic couplings were results of these type of uh, motions that were uh, caused by the methyl ammonium iodines. The curved arrow demonstrates how the um, the rotation and well, they justified the higher NAC values due to the fact that some of these methyl ammonium ions, whenever they saw I guess the molecular dynamics more clearly than these images would show. They saw that the methyl ammonium ions would rotate into the cages that were uh, by the with the perovskite structure. So they would rotate inside there, and due to that, you can see these higher uh, NAC values. And um, so these were snapshots of uh, how these uh, 
of aluminum ions inside the cages would, would rotate and cause a... So, so again, if you go back to your frequencies uh, yeah. for, for, for this previous, I think it's this, no, next one, this, this frequency kind of uh, uh, chat. Oh. So it's, they, it looks like we don't have really stretching for the CEN or any stretching, but they refer to the rotational uh, or maybe bending characteristics. What's the period of rotation? Do they report? Like how long would it take for carbon and nitrogen part of methyl ammonium to swap their order? Well, it looks like they're already showing this uh, oh. times, right? 2000. No, uh, no, the, no, 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 no. Well, it, shows no, no. it shows that it rotates, right? The snapshot showing that it rotates by 90 degrees or so, no? Like your nitrogen is on the right in at 2000 to 2.2 uh, 2, uh, 2 .2 picosecond, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then it goes to the almost left. No, not almost no, left. it just turns a little bit. The it's a little bit, like 30 degrees if... But it's, it turns by 30 the, the, degrees com, after com, some complete time. Complete rotation would, would take maybe like, like... Like three picoseconds or something like that. Three to five. Yes. Well, you can have rotation along, like... Uh, Which, again, if you remember the steps, if you say it's about... about the, well, liberation, not the complete rotation, but... Just 30 degrees back, for back, like this, right? Something like this. Not, not this, but just in one plane. But also, by the way, this Pro time procession, scale... Procession around the, yeah. the axis. You could have that one, too. That might be the one there. But, but, but the time, if you kind of say it's around, if this type of the rotational kind of motion is around two, three picosecond, again, this might be connected to these steps in a population, which also have this periodicity with a around two picosecond time scale, right? So yes. Did they mention any rotational difference the metal aluminum inside the system and surface? Can it mention any difference? Between what, the box or is it, or both can rotate at the same way, or the same degree of freedom there? Uh, well, what do you mean by, by that? The metal aluminum inside yeah. the cluster, inside the pass guide, yeah. and surface the pass guide. Does that have any difference on the rotation? There should, uh, if there is, it's basically, it's slight, it's, well, it's not as, um, Vivid as it is inside inside the structures. It is pretty. They said. But from the arrow, it seems like the mass states show that it translates on the surface. Mm -hmm. it trans that's what the up. That's what I assume the up arrow means. Translation. But the up arrow is there any total dipole showing presenting? Well, let's read this script. Curved and straight arrows indicate rotation and. Can't see the other word. Let me look. This presentation. In upward <laughs> movement, respectively. But the arrow length is the longer and smaller. Is that indicating the upward movement is different in this each? So how many metal ammonium in the both system? Is the number of metal ammonium the same? Number of metal ammonium? In what? In, in, in your both system? Oh, in both systems? No, it's not. Because uh, with the axis uh, lead iodide system right there, you see that there won't be uh, the concentration of methyl ammonium iodides is decreased compared to, I guess, the methyl ammonium yeah. iodide. Oh, one That's layer. More. That's okay. a huge concentration. But most systems are stoichiometric. Stoichiometric, yes. yes. But you have more ammonia in the uh, ammonia case. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I guess that's why they're called ammonia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are we close to conclusions? Yeah, I, I got two more slides after that. But well, the first slide you yeah. spent half an hour. <laughs> so, but am I right? Like again, they claim that it's this rotational motion of ammonia when you have ammonia terminated case, ammonia rich case, that then this kind of a dominate contribution to your frequencies, which results on this large coupling, which kind of leads to this large couplings. Yeah, it is because of the well, you said because of the terminations. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, your ammonia rich versus iodine rich. Yeah. So, so it means in, if you have iodine rich and ammonia not really on the surface, then this rotation is kind of not as efficient and results on the smaller couplings? Yes, essentially. So, a little quick remarks on this. So, they blame, so not that they blame, but they rationalize the non adiabatic coupling is the main factor for the, well, the lower non adiabatic coupling is the reason why the lead iodide system 
is com the rich one is compared to be a more photo well a better uh, choice. But can you explain how how this non-abetic couplings really relates to the properties for the photovoltaics? What exactly? Like some people might not even see the connection. I, I didn't see like, that connection all, either. <laughs> That's why I was <laughs> like. But you are presenting, yeah. right? So at least you should have some ideas. <laughs> yeah. So what exactly? Like you saying the smaller or the, like first of all, is it like you should have small non-abetic couplings to be beneficial for photovoltaics or backward? It should be backwards is what I always assumed. So it should be large non-abetic couplings. Yes. That, that, that's also, that's in the next part of my slides of where I had concerns. But I think again, here is back, <laughs> <laughs> again, which one is uh, quicker, ammonia or iodine rich case? For relaxation rates? For relaxation rates, it would be the methyl ammonium system. It and the couplings faster. are larger also for which of them? The methyl ammonium iodide, everything's, everything's so, larger so, than methyl ammonium So system. you have larger couplings for ammonia rich system, mm -hmm. right? And now read, just read your sentences here. Uh, the non adiabatic coupling is the main factor. In Rationalize the improved properties for yeah. iodine case, mm -hmm. which has smaller couplings. Yeah. So then your previous statement when I asked you the question is definitely wrong, just, well, based, just based on the observations. Because if, if you believe them 100%, then yeah. you can say, well, because they say that non couplings factor for improved properties, and we know non couplings are smaller for this iodine-rich cases, right? And it's improved properties. So then it means that small couplings, non couplings, is really beneficial for the solar cell applications. Yeah. Well, because I, I... Not large, but small. No. Now we need to explain why, some kind of... give some physical reasoning for this. Well, because I was just always under the assumption that uh, you know, the higher non adiabatic coupling uh, would result in better. Uh, okay, <laughs> what, what, is, better, what uh, is needed for photovoltaics? <laughs> what, is, what is a material when you call it's a good for photovoltaics? What is it doing actually? It, so you shine yeah. light, you're excited, right? And then <laughs> what's happening? It gives off energy. Well, of energy to what? Which energy to which energy? Again, we cannot just lose energy to nothing yeah. because of the conservation law. It just transfers from one type of energy to another type of energy. So it's not just loss of energy. It's loss of energy to which energy again? Ask from one. <laughs> Maybe not loss, but transfer. Yeah, transfer. Of your solar energy, because you use the energy of sun yeah. in photovoltaics. At least this is the reason to make these devices. You use the, the energy course, of sun yeah. and convert it to, to what? To uh, electrons, I guess. Uh, Very close. Just to stand in electrons. Change the last bit of the word. <laughs> Change the last bit of the word. To what <laughs> electrons have to do? <laughs> electrons, they provide electricity. And for this, they have to probably move. Moving move. electrons, yeah. this is your current. Moving. Oh, if they just current. don't move, it's not a current, right? In space, move in space, not in energy, not change their energy, but move in space. Well, they kind of change their kinetic energy. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to so they energy. need to move yeah. in space from left side to right side or something like that, right? So, okay, good. Now, you excite and you have now electron here. To make a current, it has to move. What if it doesn't move, if it returns back to the ground state? Would you have an efficient photovoltaic device? No, it'd be the opposite of what you want, right? So, but your non abetic couplings, at least here, right, telling you actually how quickly you return back to the ground state. If it returns very quickly to the ground state, then it doesn't have enough time to really do something else, mm -hmm. to really move to the context and create the current. So that's why you want this to be very slow. Can you go back to the density of states? I'll add something and then you will continue your explanation. So in this paper, 
you were considering uh, recombination. Via non right? <laughs> yes. Via non adiabatic uh, couples. Over, over the gap. Right? But in addition, one can consider non adiabatic cooling. Here, equal zero. If if the electrons and holes were excited higher up, and this part of relax of relaxation is good, potentially good for photovoltaic application. Depends. Depends. If you want to use Depends. It could be good, <laughs> but this part of uh, non elevated relaxation is always bad for photovoltaic applications. So the same process, but applied to different ranges of uh, electronic states. Because again, if you excite and then it returns immediately back to the ground state, you lose everything, right? Mm -hmm. So you just excite for nothing. Yeah. So you need really to have a good time so that your excited electron leaves there in this state as long as possible so it will have enough time to move somewhere else. Okay, yeah, yes. Thank you for clearing that up. I was kind of. And this is exactly what they see with lead uh, iodine enriched surfaces, uh, iodine enriched cases, right? So, like 10, 10 times, uh, roughly speaking, 23 versus whatever, 3. Yeah. Not a second, so you have about 10 times, roughly, around 10 times slow recombination for the iodine case rather than for ammonia case, which, of course, makes it to be better for the photovoltaics due to these processes. So you're just having your excited state to live much longer. So it's, it has enough time to do something else. Oh, okay. And, con yeah. and be converted to the current. Oh, uh, oh. all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that, that kind of covers up the second line too. So with the increased uh, non adiabatic couplings in the methyl ammonium system, there was just uh, stronger electron phonon interactions caused by the rotating M uh, methyl ammonium cations. The decreased uh, non adiabatic coupling uh, suppresses the non radiative, non -radiative electron fold recombination. Uh, the electron energy gap is smaller in the lead iodide system. Uh, due to this uh, effect, uh, it has an opposite effect on charge carrier uh, reaction or reduction. Uh, quantum coherence is uh, essentially the same from both cases. That one doesn't really matter. Uh, my last and final slide. Um, so something that I guess is um, that I was wondering, it goes sort of back to what you tied in. So I guess the rate of non-radiative electron flow precombination depends on these three subjects, right? The energy gap, quantum coherence, and the non-adiabatic coupling. So if that's the case, how come they state that the lead iodide system is um, the better uh, systems? I guess I was just figuring out, but I think you may have solved that out for me <laughs> due to the excited state population. That was probably one of my uh, concerns I had when I was reading it. I okay, at least one understand. point was more or less resolved. Yeah. But I think we still are, anyone wants to add something about discussion on quantum coherence? Anyone have bad ideas? I mean, sorry, Levi, a little bit better explanation than Levi has just <laughs> presented about one hour ago. <laughs> I mean, it you know, kind of tells you how long you can actually say anything with any sort of, like... Uh, what, Great, what? stop. This tells you how much you can say something with any sort of something. <laughs> I, I don't know how to word it, I guess, but like it... Like once you can't say anything with any sort of certainty at all anymore, then you've lost your coherence, I guess, is kind of the... is where I'm trying to go with it. I, I don't know how to explain it any better. Coherence like, is like the reliability of the system? Or? <clears throat> reliability on what? As my point, two-way propagate the oil, then losing their phase difference. Uh -huh. How fast is that is coherence? Phase difference I mean, in a wave function. Right? In a wave if you're function, talking yeah. about wave function, which has, we know, it has should have a phase kind mm -hmm. of component, uh, um, I5 or whatever, in a wave function. Yeah. And so this phase can be lost at some point. 
Mm -hmm. Mind due to the, mainly in this case due to the interaction with environment, right, or with uh, nearest neighbors in a system. Okay. So how fast is losing the phase known as a co decoherence here? Okay. So if you're losing the phase decoherence, that means usually it will relax faster, or you will get some idea about decoherence from the shape of the absorption curve. You mean line widths? Line width, yeah, I mean, should be a line width. Bottom, I'm saying not quite, maybe absorption emission, maybe. Oh, emission. If you're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. mm -hmm. emission. Broader line width, maybe it's, it's losing the coherence here. Slower, slowly, slower. <laughs> coherence is faster, longer. Decoherence time is longer. Sorry, deep coherence time is shorter if line width is longer. Yeah, so decoherence happens quicker if line width is wider. Wider, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, anyone I else? Any maybe thoughts? Brandon. <laughs> or maybe John. Regarding decoherence. I would say I think of it similar to the way Jabet described it because you could look at, you know, a singular wave peak and have two of them overlapping. Um, and as you're gonna move through time, the phase might shift. And so now they're at different positions, but they're also gonna shape differently. So when they're on top of each other, the overlap, if you wanna think about it, provides the coherence. And once you start stretching it out, the probabilities are no longer having a very strong overlap. So the coherence is lost. At least that, that's the way I think about it. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah, any final thoughts? We're ready to vote. Let's finish. So it was, I guess, fruitful and discussion. And the second half of yeah. our meeting. <laughs> thank you. Now thank you, you have to go very quickly. I have a lot of work to do. I guess we can make it better. Do you want to smile? Uh, Daniel likes to present. Uh, it, yeah, it helps me know that, I'm not, uh, that I have a lot to uh, work on. So. But I hope, I hope it was really not very boring because we, I don't know. It was not boring for me, <laughs> maybe because I was talking mostly. <laughs> Alice is not here. Oh, she's busy she, today with... She, uh... she missed this. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but, but, but she was helping the incoming students uh, to learn something about NTCU. You guys can't see us moving, right? Like, we're totally still and John's totally still, is that true? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, your face hasn't moved for half an hour. Yeah, you you. Oh, okay. But we can hear you at least this time. Thank you. Okay, that's good. It's a trade-off. <laughs> can we maybe do something so they will be unfrozen? Um, let's try. Well, let's jab it, load his sink, and then we'll try something to unfreeze. We can try and sign out and sign back in. Uh, but it's not us because John's also frozen. Maybe it's too much yeah, radical. Oh, it's it. Oh, it's it. Sorry. Yeah. That would take like a few minutes. Sorry, Pope. Where can I do Let me download it on the desktop. <laughs> Still doesn't work? Why is showing the user on? And on uh, coming Tuesday, you have a set of several mini presentations. If you look online uh, for the Google Docs document, you will see the list of self-volunteers or assigned uh, talks. So look on it now if you like or dislike it.
Did you want me to go on Tuesday? Was that everyone? No, no, no. Uh, you will go one Tuesday, ten minutes among big group, and another Tuesday the whole day will be yours when you will do up, update on your research project. Okay. Come on Tuesday, we will cover only basic skills for getting through the electron dynamics. It, it will be not update on. Uh, uh, personal research projects. Okay, so you just want me to talk about like how to. Yes, yes, whatever just is best. steps. Crash course or electron dynamics, non algebraic couplings, and such. Okay. So just technical? Yes, just technical. Okay, thank you guys for. And my presentation would be. Oh, okay. just, just. Should we try to bring back. Oh, sure. To make them alive? <laughs> Nothing. Back screen. Maybe it's made, if Levi told connected? that he wants to it's made, it's made log in again. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> we love them. Okay, we'll we'll, sh we'll send them recordings. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Better yeah, way. that's not. <laughs> is that, <laughs> that <laughs> terrible? It's not you, terrible. You, it's you, just before we at least saw your faces. It was a, now it's no faces at all. But we can hear you. Oh. <laughs> well, now we can't see you. Need, you need to Brandon, speak so we know what's going on. Brendan's messing on our side, so now we can not see you guys. Oh, this wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> That one's not him. This one wasn't me. I can control what we see from this. That's it. Oh, what? Get them back up. Do you guys want to re no. again? I'm saying I can't. You can't? Them. Oh, that, no. That them. <clears throat> oh, that's them. No, but they're, oh. they're up there. So how do we switch these? I don't know. <laughs> You're the one messing with it. But did you try to switch on and then switch off again? Switch oh. off and then switch on again? No, we can do that. Disconnect. Here, let's... Okay, let's disconnect. Let's disconnect. Everything is blocked out. Oh, it's still there. <laughs> no video. Can, did it update anything? No. No. We still okay. can hear, but don't see you. I, well, I would say off your TV. I would suggest us to just go because I think Javed only has like 25 minutes. But did you try the power on the other TV? Is that off? No, it, it's frozen. Uh, it's... Okay. Okay, let's go. I, I, yeah, I guess it would be better. Just, it's okay. So. Just cry when yeah. you really want to ask the question. Okay. <laughs> Scream. Scream. Okay. Yell. Holla. Okay, I guess my talk will be shorter compared to the one I will to you because I'm going to show some experimental results and with how they compare with some calculations to try to predict the structure of the uh, silver atoms. I didn't put any uh, introduction in this talk because all of us know that silver clock. Oh, it just sound okay. So the difficulties of the silver cluster is because it's very unstable or anyway ligated with, um, with uh, uh, DNA. So in that case, we cannot do any experimental like experimental evidence to get a cluster because using like extra different or diffraction, diffraction experiment or such other kind. So is it, this is one of the biggest challenge to explore the structure of it. Uh, so why you cannot use just X-ray spectroscopy? Because when the DNA ligate is not that much uh, uh, stable in that case, if we apply the high energy like X-ray, it will be 
and cluster become diffused or uh, bond between the uh, silver and uh, and DNA is not strong enough to do this one. And also, especially in the DNA cases, when we synthesize the silver cluster by using the DNA, they don't have a specific crystal structure. So it's very hard to get the structure one. So most of the time, um, I would say almost every time when I look uh, through the literature, I found that they try to get the stars and the, and the overall sizes of the cluster and they hypothesize some matter and some shape and do some calculations and compare their calculation and experimental calculation with hypothesis. So try to figure out the shape indirectly to matching their result and hypothesis. So I'm going to talk with the basically two paper mainly on the first one. They, both of them also follow the same rules and they do some uh, experiment results by about the size and shape and the transfer spectra and they hypothesize the some shape structure. They do some calculations and they match their result and to predict the uh, their ultimate structure of the dots. Another important thing is in this uh, both of them we are talking about the DNA ligated because DNA ligated uh, DNA ligated silver cluster is very unstable compared to the other one like anionic like anionic passivations in the in most of the cases anionic passivations they got a strong bigger bigger means like 20 to 24 different size of cluster and they able to do some uh, certain experiment to figure out the shape but in this DNA cases it's also more uncertain in this case so both of them, they use the uh, DNA, different, uh, different nucleotide. I'm not going to talk about the composition of nucleotide. They're saying that we know that the shape and, and emission properties depends on the- Which year? Which year of this journal? This one is 2013 and this one is 2015, I believe. I forget the exact year. I have, oh, sorry, I have. Well, is there a reason why- Yeah, 13 and 16, 2016. This one is 2016. So, so this one is a pretty common one in every case. I'm just showing you from the both of them. As I said, they do the mass spectrum sometimes, and then from the mass spectrum, they will get overall idea about the shape of the cluster and the charge. In this case, they will get this mass spectrum and each peak because of different oxidation state and and by doing some calculations because suppose like but we do so the gap between the each peak is indicating the oxidation state difference in this case and now if we if we equivalent with this equation the overall charge with uh, overall charge of the system sorry um, or in the charge class uh, was a cationic silver bonded with the uh, dna DNA will dehybridize, they lose the one hydrogen and then they form, form a bond. So overall charge of the system should be the balance of the hybridizations and the total charge of the system and then it will give you the overall charge and this gap is the overall charge of the system. Uh, can you please help to interpret uh, the experimental spectra? Okay. No, 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 just where, where you were. Yeah, I don't know how you let me use that keyboard. Yes, so this uh, rightmost panel, you do have about uh, between 1,500 and uh, 2,000, mm -hmm. two clusters, at least two more. Yeah. Uh, one with five silvers and another is with 17. Uh, can they be so close in their mass? Uh, if can, can you in interpret how different charge affects on position of the uh, cluster of the of the different mass on, on this axis? So this charge, I mean this charge is it's representing the overall charge. Overall means silver cluster with the with the DNA. So its the position is. This one is charge different because of a different ligand here. So they kind of synthesize a bunch of uh, in, in solution medium and take this spectrum, uh, mass spectrum. 
So, should we take the uh, please finger on the highest peak? This peak. Yes. This so, um, should we and on the on the bottom of this where, where it intersects? No, no, no. The highest peak yes. intersects yes. the x x axis. The value lower, lower. lower. The value of yes. the value. Like around so, 30, yeah, 1300. Mm -hmm. Okay, 1300. Should we multiply this 1300 by 3 to get the actual mass of the cluster? Because the charge is uh, 3 minus. Yeah. Can you uh, uh, explain it once again and check that everyone uh, understands it? So your axis, x axis is mass divided so, by charge. So, not the multiplied by three. I would say the difference between the x it should be three, but that difference will be give you the charge if the ligands and mass everything is same. So this one is showing the minus one. This is a plus three, but did the maybe your question is why is like the, the, they're almost the same mass, but uh, seventeen atoms of silver should be about three times heavier. No, that, that's not the same mass because ligand is different. They have 11, suppose like in this one they have a 12 ligand, this one is a 6, six ligand only. Sorry, see? Yeah, 6 ligand. So hey, Jabed? Jabed? Yeah? I, I, I think Dimitri is correct because if you look at the uh, position that is minus 3, if you take about half of that and you add it to it, that's about the position that says minus two. Right? Minus three or minus one question. I think he's trying to point out the AG yes. 17. So, 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 so the horizontal axis is just the mass to charge ratio. Yeah. So to get the right mass, you need to multiply the charge of your species. Multiply the value on the x-axis on the charge of the species. Right. So if if it shows uh, one thousand three hundred, then uh, and the charge is two minus, then the actual mass of this fragment will be three thousand nine hundred. Okay. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I don't know much about the but, mass but, spectrum. But, so yeah. but this mass correlates to just silver or together with the DNA? Yes, this mass is correlated with the whole system. The entire system. system. Yes. But then how they can figure out that it's 17 silver there? Because their DNA is huge. Because they know the DNA, which DNA they use. Oh, they know exactly the same. Exactly, yeah, because and the length, so they can yeah, figure. Like they know for sure what the mass, mass of, of DNA, DNA yeah. and based on this, they can figure out mm -hmm. what is the number of atoms. Okay. Yeah. So in these cases, they use the single DNA. I mean, a specific DNA, and so they got the different uh, mass should be different and uh, same, but this, this splitting is indicating the charge of the oxidation state difference of this cluster system. And, yeah. So they do some balancing with these equations, and then if we plot the different uh, oxidation state, it will move to the different way. But this this system is matched with experimental result. From that, they decided what is the oxidation state of the system by matching this whole different uh, methods. And this is the numbers correlated into this uh, other This board. is not the correct, I just give you some two examples because this is a pretty common technique in all cases to get the mass spectra. So this is the taken from these two, uh, these two paper ones I just showed you. The uh, first one is taken from the 2013 paper one, and the second one is taken from the 2016 paper one. So this is most of the experimental uh, feature actually. So from there, they got an idea about the cluster, I mean cluster charge. But now main challenge is to figure, to predict the, what would be the shape of the cluster charge. As I told you from the before, they don't have, they do not do any specific calculations to predict the shape. But in this case, they do something like, first one, uh, this, 
let me explain the figure first. This black and this all red means they synthesize the cluster by using a single strand DNA, and this green are synthesized by using the double strand DNA. And a solid triangle here in the both side is indicating they are emissive, and and other one is in the empty one is indicating they are uh, dark silver cluster. They are not emissive. So only triangles. This is the structures which emit light. Yeah, we do solid have triangle. Yeah. Solid triangle. So can you guide us and tell like uh, which numbers are emissive? Just a few examples. Mm, like thirteen. Okay. Four, four, uh, four, 14, 15. And the smallest one? And if you go to smaller, seven, they're not. 7 and 3. So smaller, they are not emissive here. Yeah. No, 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 but uh, 9? Yeah, 9 is emissive. 9, nine, nine and 10. 10, ten. ten. ten or 11, I guess. Yeah. And then the next one, there is no 12, there is only 13. No, yeah, only 13. 13. But, but this, is, this is based on what? This on on is, models or on experiment? The size and charge is based on their mass spectrum. Okay. From uh, previous showing this one, I just showed. So this actually, one. these uh, symbols they completely correlate with experiment. Next experiment, yeah. Just taken from experiment. Mm -hmm. okay. So they're trying to see what is the relation between the shape, I mean, over size of the cluster, and charge of the cluster. I mean, oxidation state of the cluster. Is there have any correlations between them or? But they all are rods. They are not spherical. They are continuous rods. They don't know yet. At, at they, don't, the they don't know yet. Yeah. The, the legend. No, uh, let him no? finish. Yeah. I guess okay. he will go to this point. So then, as I, as you said, they try to hypothesis the uh, different shape of the rod to uh, to compensate the total charge of the system. And but before you go, why they start with the rods in the first place? Why they cannot imagine that this is, should be a cluster? Compact, spherical. Yeah, they discuss, I'm just going to discuss in the in they discuss in the whole literature. It's kind of like I would say elimination methods. They compare their result with all other possibilities. They are, they shouldn't uh, match their they didn't match with the experiment. But this this method, uh, come uh, okay, if they can see the roots, then they match. consider yeah. And but rod also can form in a different way because it is a, it's a fixed. Uh, uh, nucleotides, so their conformation of nucleotides is fixed. So how can they compensate the different number of charges? First, uh, if you look at the very suppose like less than nine uh, cluster, the charge and the size ratio almost close to the one. So that means this is this is the fully oxidized. I mean all uh, silver atoms are oxidized here, one silver and plus one, and. In that case, they're saying that it can give you the one plus, I mean, all silver are oxidized if you get something like this one. So this one is indicating that like all silver atoms bonded with the uh, uh, nucleotides and that nucleotide also hybridized. So it can get bond like four or five silver, silver plus. But in this case, there were some other cases, this pink line is, is this ratio is around 0.67, their calculation. So if you like a lot of uh, cluster is lying on this on this on this uh, line. So in this one, if you want to compensate that much uh, charge, you need to get something like this one. So in this case, because this uh, surface uh, silver, these are oxidized, but in the center, these are neutral silver atoms. So you need to get something like this one. And if you look at this figure, it's showing one of the such a system. This and the base pair between the uh, between the uh, single strand DNA are Watson peak type, like the regular one, which one. And they bonded with the silver, and then in the middle row, this is the neutral silver, gray color one. And blue color is indicating that this charged silver. So if you if you imagine these kind of conformations, you can place around 0.67 ratio of charged clusters, charged silver atom in the in the nanorods. And another another one when you going go to the larger sizes like higher around 20 atom sizes, this is not this is below this line. So that means this uh, charge ratio is small charge and 
charged silver and the silver size, cluster size ratio is smaller than 0.67, and this line is around 0.5. So that means in these cases, they have a higher number of neutral atom compared to this kind of system. So in this case, you need to get something like this one. So if you, if you think this one, but it's very, now you need to justify the shape because why and why the charged silver are the far over there and then we, then you will get the less charged silver here so their hypothesis that in that case that dna these two dna are not bonded with the like watson creek phase they are they have, they have another type of bond i just show you i just took another picture oh, before you go can you can no you i'm just showing you no no yeah. just just like this magenta color. Mm -hmm. uh, so this structure, is it really just kind of a structure, silver metal structure from bulk material? Would it correlate? Like if you just no. look on the latest structure, no? So it doesn't look like this if you just or take it's, a metal it's or... It's an artistic drawing. In this case, this is a very simplified one. That's why it's showing up. And this is the real, they are uh, optimized. I mean, this is the indicating this kind of... But but it's completely plain structure, or you have some atoms uh, kind of like, you know, like you, you just look on the projection, or you have your charge guys going up and down, like in the different planes, or it's completely flat? Uh, they are flat, but DNA, uh, but they change their uh, flat what's that called? plane according to the DNA conformations. Because DNA is not a straightforward DNA is like twisted in the But in this if you if you compare the tetra But this is single strand DNA, it should not be twisted. No, but in this case they use that they are saying that this formed by double strand DNA. Single strand they are using you said red ones is a single strand, green ones. Yeah, is single a strand DNA, but that single strand DNA forming the Watson Creek type, I mean double strand through the silver. Because now silver is in between these two strands. Okay. So it, it's formed because the silver uh, silver plus in the either side of this one, and that silver plus is bonded with the nickel dye. Okay. But it can be bonded with any nucleotide. There's it, no any. Yeah, that's it. Again, in your double strand, you really have to have your C, G. A T to create a hydrogen bond. You cannot have C C or C A, right? In a double strand DNA mm -hmm. to make this helix. Here, you have. It can be coordinated through silver, but it can be C C G G E A C. There is no any selectivity with respect to these base pairs, right? Yeah. As you have in mm -hmm. your double strand. DNA. So it's not double. It's not a DNA type double strand. It's just a nano rods, and the two strand is attached in the two sides, in that case I would say. Okay. And they, yeah, they also saying that it's suppose like in a small cluster, even you can get it by using the single strand DNA because single strand can uh, twist it and flip uh, surrounding the small cluster. So, because it's not a real uh, straight like it can bend it and, and coordinate with the silver by circulating around the cluster. It's quite possible in that case too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so in other cases, in this case, they are saying that they are, there are two types of DNA DNA bond, like this one is a common one, Watson Creek, and they have another type of bond, this is known as a Hochstein bond. In the Hochstein bond, their coordination, this bond, uh, form this one. So this atom, this group actually, in the other side is for, is a hydrogen bond through this nitrogen bond. So point there is if you got this type of coordinate bond and you form a DNA the coordinate side and distance between the coordinate sides is longer than this one the distance between the and distance between this bond is like around 2.6 around 2.5 angstrom but in this case you will get the distance between the one unit to other unit around 3.5 angstrom so because of that they can they can facilitate like this one because this this silver atom and this silver atom distance is higher than this in this case so and they also put some reference 
I did not able to download that paper because of uh, didn't have access to that one. And they say that in that that also can help you to stabilize the silver DNA system. Thermal is therm is make thermal is stable in on this type of things. And to considering all of these facts, and they're saying that this could possible to form a one D nanorod type uh, configurations. Jabad. Mm -hmm. I have a really stupid question. Okay, so in the second slide that you just showed, you show uh, the traditional way where we think of DNA bonding through hydrogen bonding interactions between yep. um, two yep. between uh, two strands of DNA. So how does the DNA bond to the silver? So in that uh, in in the. They said that, yeah, so they have a two bonding sites. Suppose like in regular one, Watson Creek type one, it can bond it to the uh, and nitrogen of the cytosine and adenine, like same as the, is break the hydrogen bond, and the same atoms are coordinated with the silver. It doesn't make Wait, sense. So it's just a coordination bond through? Yeah, it's coordination bond. Through ionic interactions? Mm-hmm. And so then they take the absorption spectra. So this is the absorption spectra of the uh, silver 14 cluster. In the silver 14 cluster, they got a very intense peak here and the second peak here. And the black line, this is the absorption spectra of the nucleotide, what they used. So if you look on here, this, absorption, this peak is coming from the nucleotide and this peak is mainly from the, from the Silver cluster, and this, and now we need to characterize this absorption peak. How, what is that related to? What type of shape responsible for this type of sharp peak absorption peak here? So they have a lot of uh, reference. I'm just showing you the other. This is not from this paper. They are one of the reference paper. They use they calculate that theoretically, and by using the metal cluster, and metal cluster always giving this very high intense peak, and this is the. And they have, uh, they also make argument. But this, this calculation is based on this uh, without really including DNA. This is the difference. They, they, this, this one is just a metal cluster, just calculation. And I also show you one of my results. Unfortunately, my atoms is like blocked on the other side. So one of my calculations when I make a, see, uh, this is the ligand are guanine and cytosine ligands. I just um, put them in the, uh, I put them in the around three, around five angstrom distance between one and graph optimization. I got these like rod like shapes and it also giving us the very. But this is charge. This one is a two so plus two charge. Plus. Yes. And this is also charge system. This one also, I guess four plus in the so this is also give us the same very high intense low energy peak in this case. They have a very similar to the experimental one they got, what they got. And now, and they are, they are showing the argument that type of this one is uh, absorption peak is a, is a plasmon system, plasmon argument system. So they have all, all, all other uh, comparison with the experimental result. They give you like four or five different experimental and. Oh, you need to explain what is plasmonic. Yeah, so plasmonic is, this would be, I guess uh, easier to this one. So in kind of plasmonic system, especially in nanorod type things, we will we'll get the two different absorption peak, like one for the trans uh, tra transversal transversal, and another one is for longitudinal. But longitudinal. how you plasmonic peak different from regular electronic transition? Why people differentiate? Uh, I mean, why me? What the difference have been there, or are how we? Different, or maybe they are the same. I don't know. Are they supposed to be different? They are always supposed to be different. Yeah. So usually you're thinking about probably Plus. clusters, not clusters, actually nanostructures of hundreds of atoms, or maybe even more than hundreds of atoms, thousands mm. of atoms, right? So they talk about really like I don't know, 10, 50, 100 nanometer size structures mm -hmm. of silver or of gold, right? And then they talk about plasmons. 
and they see it in a range of, in case of silver, I think they see it in a green green range. So kind of the, the emission or absorption. So how is it different? Because in, in your system, your system is, looks like molecules, but mm -hmm. in the case, if you're thinking about thousands of silver atoms, mm -hmm. it's probably more metallic. More metallic and then metallic. your electronic transitions really have very small splittings. They will not really provide you any absorption, should not provide you any absorption in the two, 2.5 or whatever electron volts which correspond to this green light. Mm -hmm. So then what exactly is the origin of this plasmon peak? What's the mechanism? It's a mechanism through the electro, as an electromagnetic wave to. Mm -hmm. So you're still yeah. thinking that you need light, right? Mm -hmm. It's but the source yeah. of your electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you have almost three electrons yeah. in the metallic system, even if it's a nano system, the mm -hmm. electrons are pretty free to move, right? Yeah. And then what's it? So, and then. If what exactly, what you say, like, they're creating this wave, but what, what making this wave? So that, that, may, that wave can change the So you put charge, electron you actually charge. put many, many charges in the electromagnetic field. What do you expect happens with these charges? Just think about a model, I mean, not a real system. You mean the negative charge or cata? Some charges, no, it doesn't okay. matter. Oh, negative or positive in the electromagnetic field. What do they do? They will show you some dipole, yeah, ox huh? oxidation strength, yeah. They start oscillate, right? Yeah. Oh. Oscillation strengths? No, no, no. Not no, oxidation, yeah. They, like all these charges mm -hmm. start oscillate at yeah. some frequency, right? Mm -hmm. They kind of oscillate collectively together. Uh, yeah kind of making really this wave-like behavior mm -hmm. due to the presence of this electromagnetic field. Of course, in accordance, in response to the wherever the wavelengths uh, or whatever the energy of this electromagnetic field, the, the light which you shine, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And these now oscillations of charges also create electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. which can be kind of seen as emission. Oh, kind of, now you will have this interaction mm -hmm. in a visible range as a response due to this collective motion of electrons or of charges, doesn't matter which charge you have, plus will be do pretty much the same thing in this electromagnetic field, in a oscillating electromagnetic field, because we know light is mm -hmm. providing, of course, it's electromagnetic field which oscillates, right? Yeah. So it's a completely different mechanism comparing to the regular UVV spectrum which we usually see in the molecules or, you know, kind of and then, yeah, cluster, yeah. quantum dots and so on. Can DFT or TDFT catch this effect? No. <laughs> we need to do like LR speed. But then how do they calculate this plasmon effect? Yeah, so they didn't calculate this one. I'm just giving a show in the example of the another paper from this paper. So they calculate the plasmon by that amount of LRs. I forget the exact name of this one here. Four letter name in the matter here. Huh? What? Four letter name. They have a matter. For any differences, Maxwell equation? No, they didn't read the third one here. They were not using the Maxwell exactly. equation? Uh, I did not go through this whole paper, so I, I just said there is another one here. So, thing is, their argument is like uh, if it's, and this one is a plus monitor, so you will get the two peak, one peak, this peak is a result from the um, longitudinal movement and it's known as a LP. This one is a T, uh, T peak or transverse. And this energy is actually in these ranges, so they. When you say again, longitudinal and uh, transversional, right? So, again, it depends on the way how you can collectively move or mm -hmm. oscillate the electrons because they can oscillate in different planes, yeah. right? Either along this or along that. Mm -hmm. And this kind of difference. So they're saying that well. this atom, if they are considering the single atom nuclear, so they're saying that this should, this band should be in the constant, but this one is in this range, so they didn't have to resolve this one. But this peak is, is belongs to this compared to the so-called L peak here in the, in the from the plasmons. But again, in so this paper, they can see the infinitely long chain of these atoms. In this paper? Yeah. This, this is the uh, atom uh, like 1 to 18. 
Oh, so it's in finite structure. It's finite is structure. The yeah. Finite number value. Mm -hmm. So if this is true, so the this peak supposed to be red shifted if you increase the length of the quantum uh, nanodots. So in this peak, they are giving a same example, like they got these different peak and is moving these directions but to the red uh, low energy direction by increasing the by changing the nanorod length and these all are giving you the one peak and this is moving so from this argument they're saying that this is a this is a single uh, single atomic layer atomic nanorods atomic thickness and also is like this peak is responsible to the and length of the nanorods, and then it's going to change their shape according to the nanorods. So, in the next one, then, then there's the same question already asked: that why they are taking these uh, nanorods, not spherical shape or uh, all other other shapes? So there are uh, some, uh, some uh, in these cases. First, they're trying to show in here this peak. This peak is the first energy peak of the different type, different shape near nuclear uh, silver cluster. Uh, and, and again, this is calculations or no? This, uh, this silver, uh, this solid line is experimental result. Well. This is the first uh, energy of the first peak of different cluster. And this is the calculations of their uh, by considering as a single layer nanorods. And they also calculate the another energy by considering that this nanorod is a one silver atom is surrounded by the five silver atoms, and then it's propagate to two directions. So, in that model, it's above all of this experimental result. So they're saying that, and this is the all other spherical shape cluster energy at a very high energy. So they're saying that it's also a seemingly good agreement with the experimental results. So this is another proof of this. Uh, nanorod structure. And for why not the cluster? So, I mean, a spherical cluster, they, have a, they are saying that in a spherical cluster, when you add the positive silver atom, you know, because a, sp a spherical cluster, you can use the jellium model, like a free electron model for the spherical cluster to explain the absorption spectra. If you add the positive ion, positive silver, it's not increasing the free electron, but it increases the volume of the cluster. So that means it should it should it should increase the uh, or it should increase the fast energy peak. I mean, to the blue shift energy peaks. But in experimentally, in this study, we got that increasing the shape, increasing the uh, adding the cluster shape, the first peak is moving to the red directions. So in that case, not. Uh, it's not uh, comparable with the spherical uh, cluster. And another thing is, I don't understand this theorem and everything I just put this here. The, according to this one, they're saying that if we use the very high positive charge cluster, it can spill out the effect. Uh, I mean, charge, it can, it become like that if you increase the size, you will get the same energy peak. I um, mean, absorption spectra. Absorption spectra, fast enough absorption spectra shouldn't be good the red or positive, sorry, blue or red shifted due to the increase in the size. If you consider this type of thing, like a spatial cluster and high charge. So both of the observations doesn't match with their experimental result. So it gives us the background of the comparison of their methods with the experimental as well, I mean nanorod things. And and this is this is the for, sorry. Oh yeah. So as you, as I said a spatial cluster, I'm just showing you some example from the spatial cluster. If you look on the spatial cluster, it's not showing the very distinct Low energy peak is giving and peak and absorption spectra almost in the same energy ranges with increasing. But this is this is this is not with DNA, right? This one is the DNA. So, sorry, sir, this is not the DNA. This is with the meta sulfur meta thiol thiol groups. Mm -hmm. which are but you forgot probably to mention in the very beginning the problem if they use uh, um, an ionic. Um, 
ligands such as like silate, right? Mm -hmm. So then this same as silver, uh, silver or gold, both of them not really very emissive. Mm -hmm. But when they do it in DNA, DNA yeah. encapsulated or whatever, uh, wrapped or whatever they call it, then they become really strongly emissive, very, yeah. very emissive. And interestingly, gold is not emissive even when, when it's grown in DNA. No. But silver is emissive. And again, people yeah, they don't know what exactly the, the mechanism, but the bottom line is that ionic ligands, although we know the structure and can really use it for kind of a clear understanding the structure, mm -hmm. they don't have emissive properties. Yeah. But with DNA, no one knows the structure. Yeah, but they are <laughs> What exactly get, DNA is doing and how is it wrapped, but they are emissive. Yeah, they are able to get more than 90% quantum here in the SOM cluster in this, in this experiment. Okay, emissive yeah. only for silver. No silver. one were able to get the gold to be the as gold. I mean, they also have better emission properties than uh, silate guys, mm -hmm. but probably even not hard, like really orders of magnitude low comparing to silver. Mm -hmm. So this is a few examples of the adoption spectra in the spherical cluster. I'm just should be showing you as a reference with the comp because they're comparing with the other one. So there are some emission adoption spectra, uh, emission results. This is just a image of the emission and there they also show is there the mention there is a non obtain uh, blinking things of this system. And and this uh, emission spectra is a emission taken at 1.7 Kelvin temperature, but they say that at even, even at 1.7 Kelvin temperature, the we, uh, line weight of this emission spectra is comparably higher, that means it's decoherence faster. It's, it's decoherence faster. Which uh, temperature again you talked about? 1.7 Kelvin. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this one person still is not a very sharp is like the other lines and this is because of this thing is because of their uh, 1d system a uh, 1d system and then because of what 1d i mean nanorod type things here so it's increasing the decoherence de time sorry decreasing the decoherence time so the theorem goes like Distance a very long discussion on the just mention one in this case. And this one is a polarization, uh, circular polarization experiments. I don't have that much experience on this one, but what they say, just why I put the whole thing here actually, I don't remember everything. So, so they can, uh, they, we, I mean, at this experiment, the polarization dependence can be explained by this, this formula here. And this B is just constant, so M is dependence on the dependence on the cluster shape and cluster sizes. Cluster means your media, your your subject and directions, everything. So if it's a spherical, this M is supposed to be the close to zero, and if is the if is the one D material like nanorod types, and is supposed to close to the close to one. So if it's close to the one, at the, at the different angle, all it should give us a, this, I mean, homogeneous um, shifting, everything. So this M also indicating that what is the, uh, I would say, I forgot the exact term. I mean, what's the similarities between, I mean, phase difference of these two, two uh, way. So if you look at there, this is, this is the two different cluster but they have a similar shape. I mean, shape means like phase is similar. Phase difference is same in constant with the different polarization angle. So it's because they calculate, put everything here, and they calculate M is close to the 0.9 here. So this 0.9 is close to the one which is for 1D, I mean, nanorod type things. So that's why they also conclude that their hypothesis is true from this experiment. And this one, and <clears throat> so that's all about the first paper, the experiment, and this one is the second paper, what does it say? I put Your both call will be disconnected. <laughs> because it's... Levi? Yeah, they're done. They're gone, okay. Because it was <clears throat> just for by 6.15 or something. So,
So I put everything, I mean, very uh, brief result from this paper. So they also did almost similar things. As I show in the first uh, first uh, slide, they do the uh, mass spectrum. They predict the charge and cluster size, and then took the absorption spectra. And then they have to tell us other things, like it's not forming like cluster. I mean, uh, not as a cluster. It's forming as a they say supramolecular as a molecular system, and the molecule conformation is depends on the how it's interacting with the with the uh, new DNA base DNA base, and if you change the DNA base conformations, it can change the these supramolecular or molecular clusters, nanocluster conformation things. And they said they synthesized different type of things. I'm just going uh, different, sorry, three different uh, clusters, which one is uh, blue emissive, green emissive, and red emissive. I'm just giving it, so showing the two green and red, uh, red one. In the green one, they're saying that this one uh, first is nucleation. Nucleation started with the silver plus. It's kind of bonded with one side of this one, and then more silver atoms coming and then they form a, make equilibrium. This is the bigger image of this one. So in this case, if you look at here, this silver is, is uh, coordinated with the nitrogen from the two cytosines, and this silver is coordinated with the other nitrogen of the next cytosine groups. And then another nitrogen is coming with this one and form a triangular shapes. And you know, when they calculate their experimental, sorry, calculated uh, theoretical absorption spectra, is giving you the nice uh, agreement with this uh, experimental result. And another one, what's happening on one in the red immediate diagram? In the red one, they're showing that instead of the forming a triangular shape, is forming a, a nano, uh, I mean, nano rod type things. Like each silver is bonded with the separate nuclear uh, nuclear base and form a, this kind of thing. And the interactions is is change it differences here because if you look at here, these uh, cytosine are one after another one, but in this. This is the because this is the reason of the forming their red cluster. How many clusters. atoms again? In, both in this case, the same, the same number in both cases or not? So in this, they're, they're saying the main cluster is a four. In this one, the main cluster is forming a three. But in previous slides, you were showing that if the size is low than ten, then it's not emissive. Yeah, in that case, yeah, they're also saying that it can change there by different changes the uh, nuclear base types. Okay. But in this paper, uh, they are showing the emissive and but I guess because this is experimental one, but this is not exactly whole cluster because there are some other atoms here too. So they have interaction with these things. I mean this whole thing, it's whole supramolecules too. So from my perspective, I, will, I would prefer to say this is not because of only because of this four. We need to compare this. Uh, we need to consider this other uh, silver two in whole thing as a one supramolecule system, not as a, as a one. So their conclusion is if you change the uh, order of this uh, base pair in a nuclear ligation, they can change the formation of this uh, cluster formation of uh, shape of the cluster and it will change their absorption spectra too. And when they took this one and they're also showing the NTOs, they're saying that they have a charge transfer. They mentioned the charge transfer to the ligand, but it's actually showing the charge transfer, D to D charge transfer with the contribution of charge transfer to the ligands. And, and they're, they're saying, uh, well, the reason of the red, uh, red cluster is the charge transfer to the to the ligands. If you remember, I showed you one of my calculations. This is the, the this one is the NTUs of that system. is 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 showing that more like uh, metal to metal charge transfer. 
and this becomes a bright in mitral portion space. And although they're saying that the metal uh, charge transfer to the ligands, it's also significantly showing the charge transfer to the ligands and the D2, D2. It's also giving us a similar, good similarities with my experiment too. So from these two papers, I'm just to give, conclude this whole paper in one slide. From these two papers, one thing is clear, it's not a nano, in the DNA system, silver is not forming a cluster. If we form a cluster like 2D, 2D cluster or 3D cluster, maybe it shouldn't give us experimental agreement with experimental result. It's, it's almost confirmed to form a nanorods or rod type things. Or another thing is, or it may form the subcluster like this small cluster and the other one interacting this one. Oh, by the way, and this is also charged? What, what? Yeah, this is all, this one is, uh, has, I guess, two plus, as I get correct, but charged, obviously, yeah. And it, it's also come from almost all calculations, it's simply always form a charged cluster. This is the question, so what is the oxidation state? Plus four, or what is the ratio of the uh, charge and size? But always form a charged cluster, is for true. Yeah. But so, uh, mm -hmm. their spectra just kind of to get some uh, technical details. So do they calculate, like like the structures which you're showing, right? It's exactly the systems which they consider, like they not just consider reduced model, it's exactly with all these nucleotides. Yeah, so this is the optimized structure after calculating the QMS. They consider these all ligands biochemically and this system only quantum mechanically. And, and then they get in this factor. Yeah, and then getting this factor. And this one is the optimized one after the metals. This one and that one too. Thanks. Okay. So, this is all about these two papers. And conclusion is very just one or two lines, that's why I just I didn't put on the slide here. Okay. Hey, okay. Well, thank you. Any question? <laughs> yeah, just we have like you know to be by six thirty. We have about five minutes. <laughs> Any questions? No. Everyone is so excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then let's close it. Let's thank Jabot once again. Yeah. And, uh, so we hope to shift our time for Fridays from 4 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Depends, of course, on that. So uh, would, would it be...